Now, Buddhologists, those who study Buddhism, are known as Buddhologists. We will look at the emergence of the Mahayana tradition. It is arguably the best known of the three major Buddhist divisions, Theravada, Mahayana, and Vajrayana, or Tantric Buddhism, spanning as it does uh, a whole geographic region in Eurasia from Japan all the way to the Volga River in Russia, in fact. It is this tradition uh, where we will find the Zen tradition, the many martial arts traditions that will emerge in China and the like, which we will explore in a later unit. But to look at the origins of this movement is what we're going to look at now. And what surprises students most is the realization that Buddhism is arguably as much a Greek tradition as it is Chinese, Japanese, or Tibetan. For there were Greek Buddhists long before there were any of these other more Eastern Asian Buddhists. You may wonder how this happened. Most of us have heard of Alexander the Great and his Hellenistic Empire extending from Greece to North India up to Afghanistan. And that conquest would change this whole part of the world and contribute to the development of Buddhism as we know it today, the Mahayana tradition. This Greek Empire will dissolve fairly quickly and the Mauryan Empire will emerge from Chandragupta Maurya's son Ashoka we will see what becomes an officially Buddhist empire and he will codify many things overseeing the council and Ashoka will serve if you know your Christian history as a bit like a, a Constantine the Great codifying Buddhism helping the monks and councils define what texts are authoritative and what views are authoritative. The first council we might remember involved Ananda, the Buddha's cousin, reciting everything he remembered. The second pointed to the split between the more liberal Mahasangika sect, which will, many think, evolve into the Mahayana, though the origins are a bit obscure. And the third council will be convened by Ashoka himself and signal the split between the Sarvastivada and the Vibhajavada main schools. So the Vibhajavada make the distinctions, time, space happens sequentially. The Sarvastivada's doctrine was that times, past, present, and the future are always existent. Everything must exist in an infinite universe. But it's the Vibhajavada, those distinction-making groups who will win the day and evolve into the Theravada and related Buddhist sects. Ashoka converted to Buddhism uh, after a particularly dreadful genocide, we could say, of the city of Kalinga that he had conquered and out of remorse, the story goes, he converted to Buddhism, but was remarkable for supporting all the different traditions in his empire. He did not privilege Buddhism to the detriment of other Hindu or Jain traditions. And towards the end of his reign, he sends out missionaries uh, to all corners of his empire. Some of these will travel as far as Greece and some hypothesize maybe the skeptical school of Greek thought or the Stoic school or Pyrrhic schools of Greek thinking were influenced by these Indian intellectual exports. He also begins the spread of Buddhism, the Theravada, the traditional elder school, uh, to Sri Lanka and even to what will become Burma and Thailand. So there's probably no more pivotal figure in the history of all Buddhism than the great Emperor Ashoka. In time, the Mauryan dynasty itself will fade as all empires do, leaving Greek 
Buddhist kingdoms. Among the more famous accounts in this Greco-Buddhist kingdoms is the story of the meeting of King Menander, known to Greek sources as well, uh, and as Melinda in Pali in India, and his discussion or debate with the monk by the name of Nagasena. To understand the meaning of this no-self doctrine that's so counterintuitive, he asked, what is this no-self? To which Nagasena replied, uh, with an analogy of a chariot. He asked the king if we replace this part and this part, is it the same chariot? Yes, says the king, until Nagasena has gone through all the aspects of the chariot and the king agrees that there is no real chariot. It's very similar uh, to the ship of Theseus in Greek fame. Do we have the same ship or is it now a new ship if we replace all the parts? In time, those Greco-Buddhist kingdoms will die out uh, and in its place will emerge the great Kushana Empire, an empire largely unknown to the modern world, though as large as the Roman and Han Chinese Empire. And it was through the work, the cultural ferment of the Kushana Empire that Buddha images emerge. The Buddha urged his disciples not to make an image of him, for he was not a subject of worship, uh, but Instead, early Buddhists tended to prefer uh, to depict the deer with ears to hear the Buddha's teaching, or the tree under which he attained his awakening, or the wheel of being from which the Buddhist seeks to escape. But in time, uh, the Buddha images will emerge from the cultural effervescence of this Scythian Greek and Indian civilization, in the south, we'll see a softer, if you will, Mataran Buddha uh, in the style more of India. So here we can see the Greek Gandharan depictions of the Buddha looking like Apollo was the model, since they're both having to deal with education in some manner. And finally, the famed Bamiyan Buddha uh, destroyed by the Taliban uh, for whom Buddhist images were blasphemous. Even the word for idol in Islam is Bud because of this. These were destroyed, but then we can see a Japanese reconstruction through laser light. You can pull a Buddha down, but you can't keep them down. And so while in modern times it's hard to fathom places like Afghanistan and Pakistan as major Buddhist centers, we can see the vast amount of trade that took place really from China to Western Europe along the Silk Road and the many maritime trading routes. And this brought Buddhism east and west. And we can remember from our first unit that Buddhism was especially popular among merchants and merchants are those who carry the goods along these trading networks. So out of this cauldron of Greek, Indian, and Scythian culture emerges the Mahayana with its countless myriad millions of Buddhas, the new sculptures of the Buddha, and many statues of Bodhisattvas, as well as the enhancement of the figure of the Bodhisattva. It's not new with Mahayana, but what is new is the Bodhisattva is given a heightened role as that kind of being who remains behind in samsara, this convolution, if you will, this world we live in, to help other beings attain nirvana and full awakening. So this tradition will give rise to the many Mahayana Sutras, most will tell you, the Buddha never mentioned them. They're made up in later centuries, but they do expand the scope of Buddhist thinking vastly into the now famous Lotus Sutra with its idea 
that all beings are really part of one vehicle to salvation. And it describes the other sects of Buddhism as different vehicles, but all taking one to the same path. So it's the universalism and inclusivism of the Mahayana that really singles it out. Buddhist ethics will be codified and streamlined, if you will, into the six perfections, as they're called. Uh, these virtues you see here, the virtues of the Bodhisattva. Of course, it's commonly thought that the Mahayana, as literature, emerges first with what's called the Pragna Paramita literature, or the perfection of wisdom. We have three major collections, but the original is thought to be the 8,000 shloka, or phrase, uh, perfection of wisdom text. Uh, that contains within it the Heart Sutra that speaks so famously about the Mahayana concept of shunyata, or emptiness, which will be a key feature of Mahayana, expanding from beyond the no-self of the individual view to no self or permanence for reality as a whole. This term is commonly, I'm going to say, mistranslated as emptiness. In fact, shunyata literally means zero-ness. Shunya is the word for zero, and ta means ness. And if we look at a number integer chart, we can see the zero exists right in the middle of that. And it's thought that the very concept of the zero and its hollow shape based on the empty stalk of a plantain plant points to the hollowness of all reality. And hollow doesn't mean anything bad or negative. It means the universe is like a bubble or a foam, like quantum foam to use modern science lingo. And we can see in keeping with the Buddha's middle way, the zero lies right in the middle of the integer system, infinitely expanding out positively and negatively. And the famous founder of this tradition, the ancestor of all the schools of Mahayana from Tibet to Japan is Nagarjuna, the dragon prince. But also called the second Buddha by Mahayanas and the presenter of Shunyata philosophy and certainly the most influential propounder of the Shunyata philosophy. And let's take a look at some of the arguments to give you an idea what is this emptiness or zero-ness. In his Mula Madhyamaka Karakas, or stanzas on the root of the middle way, the Buddha uses an analogy of fire and fuel to mind, fire and fuel, body. And so in that argument, he points out at what exact point does the fuel give rise to the fire? And the question arises, if the fire emerges from the fuel, is it the same as the fuel or different? Clearly, we can touch the fuel and we cannot touch the fire. They would seem to be different. And yet, the fire is dependent on the fuel, and so there can be no fire without it. So are they the same? There's an argument for that. Many Greek and Indian philosophies will say that the world we see is just the changing of one substance. But for the Mahayana Buddhist, we can say they are not the same body and mind, fire and fuel, nor are they different because of their inherent connection. Nor are they the same and different at the same time because these two states would cancel each other out. And neither are they not the same nor different at the same time, because, for example, in this fourth limb of what is known as the tetralemma, the four limbs of Buddhist reasoning, point to a final option. To say that they're neither the same 
nor different is to point to the world of words where I can say my mind is different from my body. So that fourth limb opens up the world of conventional truth, which in the Madhyamaka or Middle Way School of Nagarjuna is still truth. So for Mahayana Buddhists, it's not about truth versus falsehood. It's about levels of truth. And even a lie is true insofar as people believe it. So the mind and body are not the same, but they're not different. They can't be both, but they're not neither either. That is the negation of Nagarjuna's own argument. And some will say and have said he negates his own view by negating the distinction of entities in our world. But that is exactly his goal. He wants to negate the idea, the, the aspects of what my teacher, Dr. Yamada, called entical thinking. Thinking in terms of real, concrete articles and objects rather than this empty energy vortex we're in that has no self or permanence. Maybe we can get at these complex ideas from another angle. Many will say that the United States exists, but then Nagarjuna argues for it to exist, it had to have a beginning, right? And presumably if it has a beginning, it has an end and a middle. But now we have the question, when did the United States begin? I've polled my own students and heard when the North American continents arose, when the pilgrims immigrated from England in 1620, the more common 1776, but one answered when the first British shot was fired at Americans on Concord Green. The historian of American history said, no, the America we know doesn't emerge until the Constitution. And yet another view was the America we know didn't emerge until the Civil War. So if we can't pinpoint the beginning of America, then we can say it doesn't have one, in which case, how could it exist? It does exist conventionally, and conventionally, well, I can say 1776, the standard view. But in fact, even on that day, was there an America appearing when Ben Franklin or John Hancock signs the Declaration? This means that America, the United States, is a figment of our imagination, but it's not false, it's real. It's conventionally true, but not ultimately true. And those are known as the two truths. So some Riti conceals the truth. In fact, there's some entity, something we refer to as America, but it's concealed by our own biases, our very human form. And Paramaarta truth means the supreme article, if you will, the paramount goal, the final truth of things in the consciousness of a meditating, awakened person. That's the ultimate truth where there is no longer an entity we call America in the consciousness of the meditator. So shunyata, it's a difficult com concept to comprehend, but Thinking of it as zero-ness in the middle way of all the numbers is helpful. And then another subsequent very huge development in Mahayana thought is the emergence of the Yogacara school or the Yoga Praxis school of the two half-brothers Asanga and Vasubandhu. So in the writing of these two, we see reality broken down in a way I was taught by Dr. Yamada, this was a streamlining of the Shunyata doctrines of Nagarjuna and in no way conflict with it. 
My advisor from Tibet, Geshe Sopa, disagreed and he thought they emphasized consciousness to the point that it looks like a self of Hinduism. These two brothers break down reality into three natures. They're called the Parikalpita nature, means the conceptualized nature where I'm James Powell and I'm from the United States. And then mediating that is the para tantra level of reality, where in fact I'm only James Powell because I'm connected to what is not James Powell. For example, my mother and father were not James Powell, but this guy came from other than me, and so does everything else, including the food I eat and the air I breathe is other than me. And finally, at that meditative level is the parinishpana nature, the fully perfected, completed nature. This points to a consciousness that can see reality as it really is, where the paratantra level is devoid of conceptualization. And then while these ideas were all prevalent in earlier Buddhism, the two half-brothers, the two brothers, uh, codify consciousness in a new way that becomes enormously influential, especially in East Asia, where it will become really the more central mode, as we'll see when we get to that unit, the central mode of understanding Buddhist philosophy, arguably a bit more than the middle way Madhyamaka school. But in addition to the five sense consciousnesses from early Buddhism, eyes, nose, ears, taste, etc., and the mental consciousness that is aware of thoughts, I'm thinking of a blue donut, uh, they add the mano, which is the place where James Powell as a personality, as an ego exists. If I'm a narcissist or the like, that's the level of consciousness you will find one being a narcissist or whatever their personality. And then beyond this, and in a way to answer the simple question, why do I wake up uh, as James Powell in the morning after having gone to bed at night? During sleep, where was I? And 2,000 years before Freud and his alleged invention or discovery of a subconsciousness, the Buddhists were already there even before the Yogacara school. But the Yogacara school defines the concept explaining that a basal consciousness of which we're not aware maintains our personality not only from going to bed and waking up, but from lifetime to lifetime. So any propensities I have will be stored there while all the other data is packed up to go, we could say, uh, as I begin my next incarnation. So the basal consciousness then holds the seventh, which also interpolates the sixth and the five senses. Among other big Mahayana themes, it's worthy of mentioning so many things we can't talk about, there are too many, but the Vimala Kirti Nirdesha Sutra depicts a common merchant as superior in wisdom to even the Buddha's great disciples. Manjushri uh, is said to have asked Vimala Kirti, what is the deepest truth? And Vimala Kirti remained silent. So we can see a hint of Zen silence of Japan already in this scripture from 2,000 years ago. Another scene in this text pointing to Buddhism's strongly pro-women stance, for the most part, relatively speaking. We see Shariputra, the intellectual among the Buddha's disciples, scolding a goddess. What could you know? You're a woman. 
Well, the goddess changes Shariputra into a woman and herself into a man, and then asks him, who is aware of the deepest dharma or reality now, mister? The Lotus Sutra has been called the gospel of all Asia. I wouldn't call it that myself, but certainly arguably the most influential of all the Mahayana Sutras. And in it, we see a classification. How should we think about the other schools of Buddhism? And here we see a depiction of the private Buddha, the Prajeka Buddha, as a goat going his own way, learning reality and awakening on their own, apart from being a Buddhist at all. And then the other of the inferior to the Mahayana view vehicles is the deer cart pointing to the Shravaka listeners, people who hear the Buddha's teaching and try to learn and get better, but it's not considered the high way to awakening, as is the mighty bullock cart, which is how the Mahayana, a great vehicle, sees itself as bringing far more passengers to the far shore of nirvana than the other two can dream of doing. Among what's considered yogachara or yoga praxis literature is the doctrine of the Tathagata Garbha that we see in the Sri Mala Devi Simhanada Sutra. A mouthful that means the lion's roar of the queen. And here we learn that even a defiled woman has the Tathagata Garbha, the womb or embryo. Garbha can mean either one or even both. The womb or embryo of Buddha within. Also, it's translated into English as Buddha nature. And so, this idea will give rise, some will claim among the critical Buddhist movement, of a Buddhist Atman or self or soul. But the deeper level of the Tathagata Garbha is not that it's a self or soul that is pure and stainless within, although that's the thinking of many Asians and many sects. In the Ratna Gotra Vipaka text, we can read that in fact it is only pointing to the potential for a being to reach full awakening, not a little pure soul inside of us. The Ten Platforms Sutra, the Dasha Bhumika, or Ten Worlds, kind of we could say, point out levels of bodhisattvas and the kind of powers they achieve as they go up the levels from number one to the tenth. At the tenth level, you're virtually a cosmic Buddha. You're able to emit multiple body manifestations, emanations with your consciousness, and you are fully aware of and living in a state of shunyata, or zero. And then strangely among the Mahayana, and not well understood in my humble opinion, are the Sukhavati Vyuha Sutras, or Pure Land, it's called, Sutras. There will arise from these in China and then subsequently Korea and Japan a whole tradition based on the Sukhavati, possessing happiness. So it can be called Happiness Buddhism, I think, more accurately than Pure Land Buddhism. But in these short texts, we find a religion of grace that we hadn't seen, and perhaps it's a Greek import. The idea that maybe I am a weak peasant, but I can call on the name of the cosmic Buddha Amitabha, whose vast consciousness upon my death can summon me to its pure realm, possessing happiness, its pure land, and there I can train in comfort within its consciousness to become a fully awakened Buddha. 
So it becomes enormously popular among the peasants of China, Korea, Japan, even Chairman Mao's mother believed this, and puts to rest the idea that Buddhism cannot be a religion of grace because there's nothing to do to get to the Pure Land except to think with sincerity and repetition, ideally, of the thought to enter the mind of Amitabha Buddha, whose name means immeasurable light awakening. So is it a person like a god or a state? I think with Buddhism we'll go with, it is a state of being. Okay, another dimension in our universe, we could say. The Lanka Avatar Sutra talks about how this Buddha nature, Tathagata Garbha, uh, is really just the basal consciousness itself. That's all the subconsciousness is the Buddha nature. And undefiled it is an awakened Buddha nature. The Avatamsaka Sutra will give rise to a whole school of Buddhism in China that we'll examine that will see our world very much like the Horton Hears a Who picture. That is to say that the universe is a hologram where every element and node is reflecting every other element of node, preventing any concrete existences. And so the building blocks of early Buddhism, they're still used as a term we're told they have no boundaries or shell, if you will, and are infinite. The Sunday near Mochina Sutra will talk about the three cycles or turnings of the wheel of Buddhist doctrine. And here it said the Buddha taught the idea of time-space units, called dharmas, uh, as a path to reach the weak-minded. Then we're told that the second turning involves the Madhyamaka emptiness or Shunyata school which we're told by this sutra was promulgated by the Buddha uh, to, to, to instill fear in the prideful, tearing down their ego constructions. The third turning is said to be the real one of the Yogacara or mentalist school, the yoga praxis school. And it's said to bring up the enticalism, or thinking in terms of things of the first cycle, and what is sometimes deemed nihilism of the second one, into a new middle way of the Yogacara third cycle of doctrine. Tibetans won't agree that that's true, that it's the top one. They will say the second one is superior, but in East Asia, this argument will hold out that the Yogacara is the perfect blend of Madhyamaka and the original Buddhist schools and their terminology. So the Sunday near Mochina Sutra points to a big development in Buddhism. How to explain things that are definitively true but have truth in them. So we get the concept of Nita Arta, definitive, absolutely true as the world of words can convey truth versus Naya Arta, requiring more interpretation. So every doctrine on the planet to a Buddhist, to a Mahayana Buddhist in particular, is Naya Arta. So you can say Christianity, Islam, Judaism are not wrong, nor Hinduism, but we can say from the Buddhist standpoint, they will say they need more explanation. And so they say that about their opposing schools also. And so the Madhyamaka will say the Yogacara system is uh, correct, but it needs more explanation, meaning to be understood in a Madhyamaka way and the Yogacara do the same. But the Sunday Nirmochana Sutra is going to say 
that the Theravada or the Bhajavada older schools make things out of what is really nothing, and so they reify reality um, and uh, thus fall to an extreme side. Uh, and on the other hand, the Madhyamaka, according to these mentalists, these consciousnessists, the Yogacara, is a repudiation of Buddha's teaching by repudiating even consciousness has gone too far and strayed into what we could call nihilism from the yoga chara point of view only. And so the great Kushana empire which spawns this cauldron of Mahayana creativity uh, will live on in the Buddhism of China, Japan, Vietnam, Korea, Tibet, and Mongolia even, but it will die out in Islamic invasions uh, in the modern nations of Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Pakistan, uh, and northern India, along with parts of Iran. So as large as the Roman Empire, uh, and yet lost to the consciousness of most people. And so, we leave it at that. We'll take a look at the future developments of Mahayana in China, Korea, Japan, Vietnam, and uh, so much of Asia. And so, we must bid farewell then to the Kushana Empire and observe how its presentation of Mahayana evolves in China, Japan, Korea, Tibet, Mongolia, Vietnam, and how it morphs and changes due to its collision with Chinese culture.